The topic, political correctness. Socialist dogma or evangelical blacklist? The answer, tonight, on Now See This Here Now Then. Hello, I'm Richard Cranium. Tonight we look at the false etiquette of the politically correct and we ask, is it gay or heterosexually challenged? But first, a word from our sponsor. Hair. It keeps your head warm in the winter and supplies sufficient self-rain on a hot summer day. Hair. Go home and comb that mop. The politically correct. A four-letter word with 18 characters spread over two separate words. An enigma of social morals that tries to define what we need to see as common sense, even though the intellectually challenged do not comprehend the basic need for such a philosophy. The purpose of being politically correct is to show what degree of woke belt you have in the ever-evolving world of sensitivity training, yoga classes, and vomit-inducing green shakes. But does it work? Well, the PC thing would be to say yes, it is achieving the desired results of retraining our society on the practices of morality and etiquette. The non-PC answer would be to say, oh hell no, it ain't working, and it's stupid. To which the PC response would be to say that it isn't stupid, but rather it is willfully ignorant. To which the non-PC response would be to tell them to go and fuck themselves. Political correctness was originally intended to bring attention to the actions and language that could cause strife and emotional boo-boos. However, as it has evolved, being PC has come to mean that you are there to police the actions of not only yourself, but of those around you by regularly calling out any social faux pas that anyone may stumble across and creating more offense to the person creating the offense than the offended who the original offense was leveled offensively too. It's a dark spiral of offensively offensive offended actions. It has unfortunately become a power struggle for those who feel powerless in social situations as they can use the basic laws of political correctness to establish dominance to a situation and passive aggressively control the people around them. Observe Exhibit A. These days, People crowdsource their censorship. The telescreen that existed on the wall in the novel 1984, that telescreen is now in our hands. That's how we censor people. We don't depend on Big Brother. We have become Big Brother. Now, some people may say, well, that's fine. You may call it Big Brother. You may call it political correctness. But it's about calling people out on racism and sexism online, and surely that's a good thing. The problem is that the people who suffer most are the smallest fish in the ocean. They're the people who don't have any power. They're the people who get called out. The big players, on the other hand, someone like, for instance, Jordan Peterson, he doesn't get called out, or if he does, he has the power to overcome it. Jordan Peterson, of course, is a tenured University of Toronto professor at the school where we're having this event. He says politically correct things all the time, politically incorrect things all the time. But he doesn't suffer much for it. In fact, his last book sold, I think, two million copies because he has the power to fight back. Political correctness targets people who can't fight back. And this plays out institutionally as well I have experience in journalism on the left and on the right. I worked for a progressive liberal magazine, and I also worked for a conservative newspaper. It was at the left-wing liberal magazine that I saw political correctness was the most acute. That's because of the crowdsourced nature of political correctness these days. It's the people within your own networks who, who hurt you. So if you're a conservative, it actually doesn't hurt you that much. If you're a conservative, the people in your networks don't mind if you say politically incorrect things. In fact, they're cheerleading you. When I worked at that conservative newspaper, my most popular columns were the ones denouncing political correctness. When I went to that left-wing magazine, 
As I said, despite the fact that the actual substance of what I was publishing, what I was saying, was progressive stuff, the people I worked with were terrified of saying the wrong thing. That's because the people in their social networks were the enforcers of politically correct orthodoxy. This is what's different from the old days. In the old days, you ran afoul of a central authority. These days, you run afoul of your friends, your colleagues, your relatives. People who have the same opinions as you and who monitor everything you say closely. Some of the smartest people I worked with in my career were at that left-wing progressive magazine. But they were people who were scared to say what they wanted to say. Because they thought that there were always one hashtag or one syllable, one pronoun, one mistake away from a career-ending utterance. Personally, I find Canadians offensive with their apologetic common sense. By using being PC as a power grab, the politically correct, better known as social justice warriors, have succeeded in creating confusing and often over-toxic versions of non-diverse diversity. The inconsistency of being PC is typically ignored and brushed to the side as the end goal of making sure everyone has an equal voice turns into a dominant narrative that suppresses not only the most harsh of ideologies, but also ones of mild dissent which could, if allowed, bring better understanding to an already difficult topic. The refusal to allow any dissent, mild or abrasive, is where political correctness has failed. The concept of creating universal morals through language has led to an abandonment of common sense and understanding context. We forget that the word is not the evil, but the tone that the word is delivered in. To put it more simply, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And the politically correct have left this simple rule behind to focus their energy so much on language that they have replaced the minor anxieties of the individual to creating a larger anxiety for the group. Observe Exhibit B. Again, I, I understand this anxiety that relations between men and women are changing. Of course, that causes a lot of cultural anxiety. Stephen, but I don't know that it's rooted get, in anything real. I get his view on this. Are we in a cultural panic? Is the response, as Michelle says, commensurate I'm with the moment? I'm very confused by this. I, I, uh, of course, I, uh, you know, I recognize the bestiality of Weinstein and the um, monstrosity of his behavior. Uh, and it was shocking to me. I actually worked for him. Um, uh, script doctoring, as it's called. Um, I never had the bathroom towel, um, uh, <laughs> uh, but for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, uh, but it's, you know, grotesque, and I, I can't imagine how vile it must be for such a powerful man. And he was. I used to play a game um, at the Cannes Film Festival where, um, in his years of power, we're walking from one hotel at the, uh, uh, at the end there, uh, all the way up to the Palais de Festival, um, you would get 10 points every time you heard the word Harvey. Um, and you'd usually, a 10 minute walk, you'd have a 300 points. Because it was, yeah, Harvey's got the script, Harvey's got it. Yeah, um, I've got a meeting with Harvey at the Majestic uh, uh, in the afternoon. He was immensely powerful. And I think that's ob obvious that someone in that position, uh, uh, abusing and threatening and uh, hindering the livelihood of women is, is grotesque in, in the extreme. But I have to tell you, uh, there is, genuine feeling amongst many people I know that, shh, that we can't speak our minds. We can't actually speak to the true nuance, the true depth of sexual romantic feeling between men and women. It's not a subject I'm absolutely expert on, but it counts <laughs> between men and men as well, though I know when it's men and men, you might say, well, that's different because their women have had a different experience in history and I don't want to enter that uh, particular field. But I would say that there is real fear uh, in my business, which is where this all started, show business, acting, and so on. Um, yeah, people are uh, rather afraid to speak about a piece of, you know, uh, publicity that's come out or a statement that's been made. You just go, yep, yeah, absolutely, and wait for the people to leave the room before you can speak honestly with your friends. Um, and that's... I've never experienced that in my entire 60 years on this planet. This, this feeling that, um, and I'm not characterizing feminists as, as in East German, but it's like that, the stars are listening. You better be careful, they're listening. Uh, and that's a genuine feeling. I'm saying that with my hand on my heart. I'm not saying it to make a point other than the fact that it's true and it's 
worrying. Uh, but the sexual misadventures and horror experience is worrying too. So they're two worries, and they're, mm. they're not solved. Let's bring. Well, like I said, okay. <laughs> so, like I said, um, you know, the the reason a few months ago, right? You you contacted me, asked if I wanted to do a debate about identity politics, and then you presented me with this resolution, and I said, well, there's like a lot of things that people call political correctness that I'm not mm. going to defend. But then I realized who I was debating and, and, and saw that there was a lot of things that you, Jordan Peterson, call political correctness that I call progress. Um, and, and to some extent, you too, Stephen Fry, you know, when you talk about it being outrageous to tear down, or not outrageous, I, I won't put words in your mouth, but that we shouldn't be tearing down statues of kind of notorious racists, that we should just instead be throwing eggs at them. Um, you know, so those sorts of things, if you call them political correctness, I call them progress. Now, this feeling of being silenced, which I understand, although it seems very vague, right? You kind of are not quite putting your finger on who is silencing you, except for a vague fear that if you say something untoward, you're going to be the subject of, I'm not shaming. sure. Yes. Uh, sh shaming, but by who? Yeah. But by, by what? By I'm the internet? The names. <laughs> no, but I mean, point. I'm scared. I'm you're, just, but if you're I'm scared. listed, <laughs> but that's again, the point. You're scared. We, it is a culture you're, of right. fear. I understand there's that element yeah. of fear. What I'm saying is that it's it's a feeling. It's a feeling that is this sort of intangible result of on. Oh, I think on. primarily. We've all, we've all seen the sort of show trial thing where the person then apologizes. I have so much to learn about sexual politics. I am really sorry. Uh, signed a lawyer, crossed out the name of the person. <laughs> it's, it's, you think the okay. real mistake of our left is that we underestimate the right. The right isn't as stupid as we'd like them to be. If only they were. Oh, if think... only they weren't so cunning, so sly, so smart, so aware of our shortcomings. And, and, and I just fear that political correctness is a weapon that they value, that the more the more we tell the world how people should be treated, how language should be treated, what words are acceptable, what attitudes are acceptable, what HR meeting is going to tell you in a long bullet-pointed list about how you look at people. All of this is, is meat and drink to bad people, to malefactors, to bad actors. I'm not counting myself as one of those bad actors in that sense. I mean bad actors in the other sense. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a large homosexual British man. So what do we do with the political correctness if it creates more negatives in an attempt to level the playing field? I think the answer lies in a basic understanding that most human beings are not stupid and do not want to purposely hurt people. Cancel culture has taken being PC to a level that is unattainable even by those who advocate for it. It has taken the idea of creating diversity and stripped it of the philosophy of being diverse. And the other problem is that when you allow easily obtained power to any group, they will overexploit their power. That's human nature. The history of mankind is covered in endless stories of the usurpation of power by one group over another by forcing those out of power to kneeling to the wishes of those in power. Political correctness, whose underlying core is built on a Marxist ideal of equality, uses that same core ideal to segregate those who disagree with it. Reminds me of something my wife Vega told me the other day when she said, Richard, don't bother me for the next two hours. I'll be having sex with the pool boy. That woman's imagination is a universe of endless possibilities. What it comes down to is simple. Political correctness has value when it is used in conjunction with understanding context and tone. When those two things are ignored, being PC leads to non-diverse ideals that threaten to imprison and destroy opposing ideas that could lead to compromise. And that's how humans learn to live with each other, through compromise. In the liberal and conservative circles of our nation, we hear the constant complaint that compromise or nonpartisan politics has been lost. I would venture to say that the leading cause of this is the overuse of political correctness in our culture. Canceling a person based on how they choose to put forth their point of view is not diversity. It's Orwellian. Once we realize as a whole 
that we cannot call for diversity and then deem only one view of diversity as the only way to see it, then we will understand the proper use of being politically correct. Until then, I can only hope that we continue to let our own individual natures drive how we treat each other. And yes, there are some bad apples in our culture that present challenges to even that line of thinking. But as my grandfather Cranium used to say, one bad apple doesn't make the whole barrel socially inept. And that's all for tonight. Join us next time when we look at footstools, socialist human rights, or evangelical welfare. You decide. Until then, I'm Richard Cranium. Ta-ta.